Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's John Davis. I'm the director of the Strand Group here at King's College London. You're all extremely uh, welcome. Uh, this is the 27th Strand Group event, uh, and this one proudly sponsored by DXC Technology. Uh, with future challenges for the Ministry of Defence, I give you the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Defence, Stephen Lovegrove. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, John, uh, for that kind introduction. I have to say that um, I came to the wrong entrance into King's this evening, and I went up to the lady who had a clipboard, um, uh, and she was obviously checking people in for a speech, and I said, I'm here to give the speech, and she said, oh, good, you must be Michael Arditi. You're speaking tonight on the subject of an evening in Sodom. So... Uh, <laughs> So that can now be the title of this speech. Unless you want to nip over the road, there's, there's a, that's what's going on. Anyway, um, I was invited to speak to you tonight on a topic that illuminates current challenges in defence. And I'm sorry to have to tell you that the list from which I had to pick was a very long one indeed. In the words of a long distance, long distance boss, I was overwhelmed by opportunity. Two weeks ago, I described how the MOD was undertaking the modernising defence programme, how we were aiming to meet current and future threats at a time of accelerating cha challenge and contest. I was surprised by a question afterwards, in which it became clear that there's a perception that somehow defence is forging its own path, separated from the other parts of national security. The question was also raised by the Public Accounts Committee and also at a briefing I gave to journalists both last week. So I felt I need to demolish it before it achieves the status of fake news because nothing could be further from the truth. I'll talk shortly about how defence is intimately and inextricably woven into the fabric of government in ways that are all too often invisible. But the Russian poisoning in Salisbury has furnished a stark, highly public example of how defence assets serve the nation all the time. Our personnel at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory have been pivotal, indeed indispensable, in the investigation, working under long-established agreements and relationships, adding their skills where and when they are needed. We should be very proud of those men and women. No other European nation would have been able to bring anything like the expertise of Portland down to bear. But while it's important, that is only one example. Since joining Defence uh, six months after the SDSR 2015, and after committing to memory the seven, yes, seven closely typed A4 pages of acronyms at the back of the Defence Plan, there have been two reviews of our activity. As I've said elsewhere, I'm not troubled by that, and the rapid developments that we're now seeing may mean that we need, may need to be less monolithic about the way that we assess defence and security spending in the future, as indeed other countries are. In any event, I've enjoyed every minute of it, and the National Security Capability Review last year, and now the Modernising Defence Programme, have allowed me to go back to first principles and to ask, what are we really here to do? How do we best serve the nation? How do we best meet the government's agenda? And despite all of the talk about defence's budget at the moment, we are crystal clear that we are but a part of a larger whole. We exist not to fulfil our own destiny. We exist to defend the nation with partners and with allies and to achieve the objectives of the government as a whole. The MDP is our opportunity to make sure that we have the right capabilities when the pace of change of forecast threats has quickened alarmingly. We must build on the plans for joint force that we set out in 2015, making sure that it is more effective in its impact, more resilient and more rapidly innovating, or perhaps more precisely, more rapid in the deployment of our innovations. Our public consultation has opened and I'd encourage you all to contribute. Let me offer you my thoughts on what I believe the nature and nation wants us to focus on. Relevance. We must be active today and prepared for tomorrow. That is not easy. Our defence programme must provide kit and capability for our forces who might use it hours later, but at the same time we are embarked on multi-decadal programmes to provide contingency forces. 
including the provision of our nuclear deterrent capability that will still be in use in the 2060s. To be successful, we must excel at both ends of that spectrum. International and integrated. Whitehall is at its best when it works together, bringing all the instruments of government to bear on the national challenges of the day. Defence must absolutely play its part, leading when required, supporting at all other times, particularly in the international space, working together to advance the nation's interests. Modern deterrence. One of the most fundamental but often least understood roles of defence is to deter. More, most, most often deterrence is understood by our nuclear capabilities, but that is not enough for the modern era, and we need to think and act more widely. And I will return to this later. And affordable. We are all taxpayers, unless anybody in the room wants to confess something. We, I, have been very straightforward with Parliament that we currently face some real affordability challenges that we must seek to resolve on an enduring basis over the coming months. We all want to ensure that defence spends wisely, has a stable financial base, and has a forward programme that can respond to what the future throws at us. You may disagree with these, though I doubt and I hope not. You will, I am sure, want to offer your own thoughts to our public consultation, and I would wel welcome them. But what I hope you will take from my words is my commitment that defence will play its role in a whole of government context. From security to exports, prosperity to war fighting, intelligence to deterrence, the MOD will work deeply integrated with partners across Whitehall and beyond with a clear focus underpinned by common aims. Some further examples. Salisbury showed our personnel, military and civilian, deployed at speed to assist with making the area safe but also offering fundamental support to the authorities through analysis and expertise. The concept of defence contributing to other departments and to the national endeavour as a whole is nothing new. Our nation, national history is littered with the dynamic benefits that come from Whitehall pulling together to drive forward the national ambition. We are only two days away from the anniversary of the Westminster Bridge attack. Last year saw a number of such terrible events in Manchester, at London Bridge, at Finsbury Park. An integrated government responded. It is only right that every hour, every day, even at this very moment, the British people should expect and should receive the reassurance that every arm of government is committed to their safety and defence. We activated Op Tempera on two occasions last year for exactly that reason. You will all remember the armed forces who were deployed within hours, supporting the police, providing the committed and stable resource to reassure and to protect. Armed police units were then able to deploy elsewhere, chasing down the threats and tackling terrorism head on. Our integration across Whitehall is not, not just with the usual suspect departments, however. We work increasingly closely with the National Crime Agency, helping to seize more than £100 million worth of drugs in recent years. We are working with DEFRA to train elite anti-poaching -poach trackers in Malawi. There is a standing operation with the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to provide for the secure fuel supplies in the case of emergency, one that is constantly kept fresh and trained for. The Department for Transport relies on defence for its aviation security technology and capability. Since 2013, our science and technology teams have supported 555 police cases invo involving explosives, resulting in 113 prosecutions and 784 years of custodial sentences. Looking beyond these shores, some 10,000 personnel are currently committed to NATO tasks, with our enhanced forward presence in Estonia, and Poland, our forces standing by for the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, and from May, air policing in Romania once again. Looking further afield, we remain committed to the Middle East, degrading and destroying Daesh. In South Sudan, our UN peacekeepers work in the harshest and most degraded environment alongside our multinational partners, aiming to secure peace in the world's youngest nation. And as the global environment continues to evolve, we must recognise the increasingly interconnected world in which we live and, to, and keep pace with it. The success of a military mission might depend as much on a diplomat ob obtain obtaining overflight permissions from a partner nation as it does on the soldiers in the back of the aircraft. And the output of other government departments and agencies often relies on our contribution. We're reinforcing our close and enduring relationship with France, deploying three Chinook helicopters to Mali. 
and looking uh, and the UK is looking forward to welcoming the French to enhance forward presence in Estonia later next year. We're also progressing smaller fo focus groups of like-minded countries, usually taking the lead. The Joint Expeditionary Force, a close alliance of the UK, the Baltic and the Nordic nations is a paradigm example. History and experience show that some of the closest relationships to be made stem from joint endeavours in dark times. And beyond Europe, our friends and allies are diverse and numerous. L later this year, thousands of UK personnel will deploy on Exercise Safe Surya in Amman, a clear demonstration of our ca capability to deploy at reach, working with our partners. We will need to intensify our relationship with India, Japan and Australia, and we are doing so. And we have the capability and the will to deliver on our intent. This year we will see deployments of both HMS Sutherland and HMS Argyle to the Far East, demonstrating the UK's commitment to security and stability in that region and to the freedom of navigation. Last year, Royal, Ar Royal Fleet Auxiliary Mounts Bay was in the Caribbean helping to respond to Hurricane Irma. She's back in the Caribbean right now, restocked and poised to respond to more extreme weather if required. And these visible tokens of our activity are not all. In a speech, it's probably ra rare to use the words, and what I can't say, but that it, this is that moment. You will be unsurprised, and I hope you will be reassured when I say that defence has niche skills deployed in support of other parts of government in the UK and across the world. The UK's defence is a complex machine built of multiple moving tasks, parts, and it is uh, unrelenting in its operation. From our intelligence analysts that can use a covert photograph to identify the specifics of a foreign capability, to the forward operators who take that image from the air, from under the waves or on the ground. From our training teams that work in faraway places, making sure local forces have sustainable capabilities to tackle threats that matter to them and to us, to the surveillance specialists that you will never see. Defence is constantly active, often in the most difficult and sensitive circumstances, to ensure that our other government partners, both British and other, can get to work. It would be wrong to go into detail, but it would be worse not to recognise it. We are where it matters and when it matters. We are and will remain relevant to those challenges and must be recognised internationally as a key responder. We need to understand clearly our national security objectives and where we can lead. And we need, better to, uh, we need to better explain where our capabilities and expertise lie. Nowhere is that more acute than in the sphere of de deterrence. Deterrence is a concept that is much less well understood today than perhaps it needs to be. I have to say, I think it is rather better grasped elsewhere. In a fascinating piece in last Thursday's F Financial Times, Valentina, a retired secretary and Muscovite who refused to give her surname, was reported as saying, and I will not do the accent, we my generation, we used to say, if only there isn't war again. That's what our nuclear weapons are for, to ensure that no one attacks us ever again. Today's prevailing concept about defence in Britain, at least held in Britain, is one of insurance, which is not only mistaken, but dangerously so. It leads to a conception of defence that can only be used in conflict, in the same way that flood insurance is only activated when there is a flood. By extension, if the impoverished homeowner's house is in no danger of flooding, their incentive for taking out any insurance will recede to nothing. Defence capability does, of course, act in that way, and the possession of a military that cannot be effective in the case of war is a fatally compromised one. But as Valentina reminds us, its equally, perhaps more vital aim is to prevent war in the first place. She was very keen to point to the Russian nuclear arsenal, developments in which, uh, of which uh, M Mr. P President Putin uh, boasted about in his State of the Nation speech last month, and apparently very popular they were too. In the UK, the deterrent too is shorthand for our nuclear tip missiles operating from our undetected submarine bombers, which have been in constant readiness since the 60s, and which the great national enterprise of building the new dreadnought class will sustain. And the leading British thinker and practitioner of deterrence was, as the audience knows, Sir Michael Quinlan, who we celebrate next month in the Legends of Whitehall event. He is most closely associated with nuclear deterrence, 
but unlike Valentina, his thoughts on the subject were rather more wide-ranging than a sole focus on the uniquely destructive power of nuclear weapons. He was, in the modern parlance, a full-spectrum thinker. The aim of deterrence was to prevent all war between sophisticated and well-resourced states, not just nuclear war. Firstly, conventional war is bad enough to wish to deter, and secondly, war at its most destructive levels can in any event only be reached realistically through lower ones. In Sir Michael's words, deterrence cannot operate only by the means of nuclear weapons. The various levels of military force are therefore complementary and interdependent, all contribute to deterrence. He wrote those words in 1997, a couple of years after the, uh, a couple of years before, sorry, no, a couple of years after the end of history had been announced. His analysis is the more durable of the two, I think, and I would say that his key insight has even greater relevance and force now than it did 21 years ago. Why? I give you two reasons. First, it is clear that contest between states is much more acute now than it was then, with a greater number of states engaging in that contest in possession of a broader array of weaponry. The reality, which we would do well to recognise, is that that situation is not going to disappear. And though this is not the place to expand upon it, the dispersal of extremely powerful weapons into more and more irresponsible hands will pose serious issues for the non-proliferation treaties that have kept us safe for 70 years. Secondly, the sheer range of weaponry is expanding very quickly, much more quickly than Sir Michael could have possibly predicted in 1997. Though they do not replicate the enormous and binary increase in destructive potentiality that the atomic bomb represented, autonomous systems, directed energy weapons, and cyber, to name but three, are all changing what warfare will look like, and they will do so sooner than we might imagine. If we recognise this, and recognise and exploit our comparative advantage in these areas, it will be to the UK's benefit. I do not believe that doctrine has altered very much as a result of this technological abundance. Not in Russia. States have always engaged in full spectrum and indeed asymmetric contest. Indeed, Sun Tzu talks of little else, albeit more elegantly than his modern successors. But what is certainly the case is that modern technologies to date have been to the advantage of nations who have, shall we say, less legally constrained models of action. And in particular, who have placed greater reliance on deniability. What are the consequences for the UK of these developments? In the first place, defence must be visibly active and visibly deterrent at all points on the spectrum. An example, defence works very closely with the National Cyber Security Centre by sharing information, skilled people and funding amongst other things, in order to support their work protecting the UK in general from cyber threat and to exploit their specialist expertise within defence. This is deterrence by denial. It is unlikely to be enough. We need to be credibly capable of deterrence of the imposition, uh, by the imposition of unacceptable cost in this domain. We need to shift the focus to offensive capabilities to deter the most damaging state-enabled attacks. Being active at all points, however, will fail if capability resources are too thin. And we should be very considered about what that means. We will never maintain in the UK all the capability required to defeat a nation that is prepared to devote massively more of its wealth to its milita military capability. Fortunately, however, our allies and our alliances are the other vital foundation upon which our security rests. Accordingly, we must invest in our international relationships and the values that bind us so that we can rely on others' capabilities and forces in ensuring national and collective freedoms. It is an absolute priority that as the UK leads one international club, it redoubles its efforts to be a leading voice in all of the others, and indeed to play as full a part as we can in any emerging European defence and security structures, with all that entails by way of our own visible national resource choices. These should be profound decisions that the nation takes consciously after full consideration and Professor Chalmers' recent admonition must be properly confronted. 
the more radical the commitment to the rapid fielding of new disruptive, disruptive technologies, the less useful the traditional measures of military capability become as indicators of national military power. And when we have made those choices, we must be confident that what we have and what we propose to have and what we propose to use is fully effective against the range of threats that it faces with the right levels of survivability. There are few areas where being one brick thick is going to be enough. Let me return to where I began. As a taxpayer, I expect the government to make the most of what uh, it has to better defend the nation and to advance the interests of our people. We must not duplicate unnecessarily. If we innovate, we must share. If defence prospers, we must look to spread. But most importantly, everything we must do, we must strive to do in an enduringly affordable way. A stable forward programme is a deterrent more than it is a bureaucratic nicety. The continued media narrative of defence cuts damages our national rep international reputation and lowers the deterrent effect that we have on our adversaries. This is at odds with our growing defence budget rising to £40 billion in 2020 2021. And the actual reality is that we are a forward-looking organisation that takes every opportunity to look at what we have, to look at what we need, and to address the difference. Achieving enduring affordability is a much more dynamic process, enabling us to invest in the latest technology at, as the, our American allies say, the speed of re relevance, to shorten the distance between innovation and deployment, to get the right procurement approach to seize the initiative when required. Success in this area is also reliant upon gaining the public and, and retaining the public's trust and support for what we are doing. And this is not always as easy for defence as it might be. Healthcare free at the point of delivery is a powerful and clear policy. And the health service is a machine, transparently and obviously in operation all the time, touching everyone in the country multiple times a year in profoundly important ways. Similarly with education, Defence is not like that. It has a harder case to sell, especially in times of apparent peace. But it is active when, even when silent, to ensure that the worst does not happen, to deter. Indeed, anything that does happen is, by definition, something that we and our allies did not deter. I want there to be a better understanding of that as we seek to modernise defence. And that understanding must extend to our adversaries our extended deterrent must operate on the thinking of others. To conclude, I would ask for your support in the important endeavour to make the case uh, better for what we do, how we do it and how important it is. The idea of a CBRN attack on British soil by a foreign state was, a, was largely confined to television until the w events of a few weeks ago. The vital work done by Port and Down was brought, has brought it to the front for, forefront of people's minds. The money we had invested in protective equipment was quickly recognised as the armed forces assisted the authorities in clearing up the site. With, within the unavoidable limitations of foresight, we have to make investment choices. We need to be prepared. The broader the conversation, the clearer our vision. So I hope what I have said here has done a number of things. To reassure you that Defence has not declared UDI, and this includes our work on the modern, on modernising defence programme. To inspire you in just what your armed forces and defence civilians are doing at home and worldwide, right now, every day. To prompt you to a renewed appreciation of deterrence, full spectrum and interdependent deterrence. And to provoke you on what the future might hold. Your ideas are needed to make that future a better one for the whole of government, for the whole of the nation. Recent news headlines have demonstrated that in those areas of business where I am necessarily tight-lipped, we need to do more to put the UK ahead. It is often easy to focus on the adversary, to devote your time and energy to understanding the threats you face, and of course we must do that. But our, modernizing, uh, our programme to modernise defence is as much about understanding ourselves as it is about understanding the challenging environment in which we work. If we get this right, we will be building a modern de uh, defence capable of deploying our capabilities where our national security requirements and our friends and colleagues need them most, <coughs> capable of adapting at speed, ready for what is to come. Thank you.
We have time for questions. Can I have name, affiliation, and a nice pointed question? Who's first? Over here, please. Hi, um, Abigail Watson, the Remote Warfare Program. Um, quite a lot of your talk, um, I've recently we've been feeding into the, the force development with the Army as well, and I've, I've noticed the same thing, that there's been a prioritisation of kit and capabilities and an emphasis on the most dangerous threat rather than that of, of the most likely and on personnel and how our personnel develop to the future of defence. And I wonder how much we should be looking at the the threats we were most likely to face, which seem to be engaging through local partners, and how well our forces are currently adapted to the way in which we're engaging, not in terms of kit and capabilities, but in terms of training, cultural understanding, language capabilities. Um, well, it, it is obviously um, a range. Um, I mean, I can assure you that in the Modernising Defence Programme, uh, there is a big strand um, of it which is really designed to do a sort of rather more traditional type of defence uh, review. There are three strands which are about uh, efficiency and making sure that we have the, we use, we make the best use of what we've got, but there's one which is a more capability focused one and the, um, there is a um, substrand in that um, which is absolutely about people. Um, and we cannot get away from the fact that all of this kit is going to be absolutely no use at all if we haven't got the right people to be able to um, deploy it and utilise it. And we also cannot get away from the point that you make, that actually the vast majority of times, the very, very expensive, the very, very high-end kit is actually not the kit that we use on, a, on an ongoing basis. And um, defence does an enormous amount of capability building, in, uh, particularly in <coughs> Africa, uh, which is absolutely critical for our uh, national security because we will be best um, protected by um, you know, nation states not falling into the category of being failed nation states. So we have a very um, extensive uh, uh, programme in, in, in that area. I mean, I, I would say that there is a, um, a particular challenge for defence at the moment because a point I made about sort of, kind of one brick thick, we've got some very, 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 very sophisticated kit and um, it's very, 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 very expensive. And um, we don't have the resources to be able to uh, maintain um, an awful lot of those types of um, uh, capabilities. Uh, so when a couple of them go down, the Type 45 being tied up in Portsmouth as an example, um, the capability begins to erode very fast. Um, th the, th we will need, I think, to invest um, in a different type of personnel to be able to make sure that that particular dynamic doesn't get on top of us. It's not on top of us at the moment, but you can see that it might do. And I think that that is likely to mean that we're going to have to uh, be rather more um, Catholic and open and welcoming to um, people who wouldn't necessarily uh, join the armed forces. They're going to have to have a degree of sort of technical and technological and log logistical sophistication that. Uh, that will keep those capabilities working. Thank you. Nick? Thank you very much. And can I just, sorry, I'm Nicholas McPherson uh, of King's College London. And um, first, can I say, Stephen, that it's great you're here. And just underlining that, I think it's a really important role of the Defence Permanent Secretary to get out there and engage on these issues because too often in recent years it's been left to the generals and the uh, vice marshals and so on, and they're great people, but actually you represent the overarching system, so um, it's fantastic you're doing that. I'm, um, I just want to pick up on the sort of subtext of, uh, of a lot of what you're saying, which is basically that the uh, Ministry of Defence needs to be better resourced. Um, 
come, having spent 30 years in the Treasury, um, I'm, I'm, I'm used to this issue of how you prioritise resources. And actually, I'm a great fan of the Ministry of Defence, and I think um, Britain has a comparative advantage in the defence business, so, um, so we should do more of it. But you've got, to, you've got to persuade the old folk that they shouldn't have a triple lock because uh, we've got to pay for it somehow. Anyway, <laughs> pick, <laughs> moving along from the, the issue of how you fund it all, um, there is a big issue around prioritisation. And I remember back in, we never actually tabled these proposals, but in the run-up to 2010 election, the Treasury went through various exercises of 30 billion cuts, 60 billion cuts, and 90 billion cuts. And I'm pretty sure that in the 60 billion cut package, it was certainly in the 90 billion cut package. Um, it involved abolishing the Royal Navy. Now, obviously, <laughs> I would, I would never <laughs> propose abolishing the Royal Navy. Actually, I would prioritise it over the other armed forces. <laughs> but, but the reality is that the revealed preference of the British people is not, and the politicians they elect, is not to spend huge amounts of money on defence. They like the glory. They don't like paying for it. So, um, isn't it time? Isn't it time, Stephen, <laughs> that um, we faced <laughs> Scuffle facts those ships. and stopped, <laughs> stopped indulging all three, plus the Royal Marines, uh, all three of our great armed forces, and that uh, we merged a couple of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to get into the debate particularly about whether or not we need more money. I do think that um, the reason I quoted Malcolm Chalmers cause, is because I think that he, he, he does make an important point. Um, if we are going to invest in um, new, highly disruptive technologies, um, that is going to come at a cost and we need to be rather more um, ruthless, unless there is to be more money, about getting rid of some of the ones which are actually deployed um, or uh, less often or, or, or incapable of being uh, deployed with any degree of uh, responsibility because actually they won't be able to keep the men and women safe. And I think we do have some of those capabilities and we need to, w w we need to be, um, as I say, sort of prepared to slay the odd sacred um, cow. Um, I don't know whether or not merging uh, a couple of the uh, armed forces is um, an idea that it would be safe for me to <laughs> advance. Um, you um, grizzled figure that you are would probably uh, be better off in doing that. Um, what I can tell you is that there are um, lots of capabilities which those forces share where um, they have um, uh, you know, very similar capabilities which are managed and handled and sustained and trained for in completely different silos. And one of the things we're going to try and get after um, is um, to make the most of those. So for instance, uh, the Air Force and the uh, Army have just agreed um, to uh, take the integration of their helicopter forces to a much, 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 much greater uh, level than they have been <coughs> hitherto for. Um, and I think there is an awful lot of work um, around, that, uh, around that area. I mean, you are, of course, r right about um, where defence stands in the um, national psyche. I was looking at the Mori, um, uh, you know, the, the periodic m m Mori um, survey, which says, you know, what's on the top of your mind? And it was the, you know, standard ranking. Um, and it's health at the top and then education underneath that. Brexit, I think, has made a, uh, a, a bid for one of the top three places now, which obviously it didn't in the past. Right at the bottom is defence. And defence is quite interesting because all of the rest of them go sort of kind of jiggle along like that. Defence um, basically stays at the bottom with enormous peaks. And when something goes wrong, um, then uh, that's um, the moment to mount the argument. <laughs> Thank you. Over here. Good. Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Wynne Bowen. I'm head of the School of Security Studies uh, here at King's. Uh, many thanks for the, uh, for the uh, remarks this evening. 
Um, I've got a question around um, deterrence and around credibility of deterrence. You know, I'm an academic, right, so we, we do try to break these things down uh, quite a bit. And you've hinted at some of these aspects al already, but I was wonder wondering if you could delve a little deeper on the challenges and the constraints to developing and maintaining credible uh, deterrence across the full spectrum of risks uh, and in the multiple domains. Thank you. Well, uh, the nuclear deterrent is um, entirely effective um, and that is entirely credible um, and always has been and um, I hope it always will be. Um, deterrence across the um, full uh, range that um, I mentioned in, the, in, the, in my remarks um, relies, I think, uh, very um, heavily on allies and alliances. Um, it is, um, it seems to me, to be pretty unlikely that the kind of people that we w would w wish to deter are likely to be deterred only because of the capabilities that the UK has as a sovereign um, nation. Um, I mean, there are some types of examples like, you know, the, the Falklands, but um, in that situation, which is a, a war which we were capable of winning by ourselves, it didn't d deter the war sort of kind of happening. So, you know, question there. Uh, I mean, I think um, if you're thinking about um, uh, the n nature of some of these m more m modern capabilities, um, then we have a question to, we have a number of questions that we need to um, ask ourselves and come up with a, a straightforward answer to. One is that we first of all need to pick the right ones and to invest in them sufficiently to make sure that they are actually um, going to be credible and going to be survivable. And secondly, we need to think rather more carefully, I think, about <coughs> our doctrine and our strategic communications because um, w we have, I think, grown too used to the idea that, um, uh, you know, we, we can deter through, the n through our nuclear forces and everybody knows about those. We are going to have to deter through other forms of um, capability as well. And I don't think that we have a very a clear enough view at the moment about how, what type of um, capabilities we're prepared to publicly declare, covertly use. I mean, all of these things are, are, are complicated and there will have to be quite a lot of doctrinal thinking about it. I think. Thank you. Rod. Uh, Stephen, uh, Roger Hood, DXE Technology. Um, thank you very much for uh, covering such a broad spectrum of um, opportunities, challenges and activities that the MOD is um, uh, engaged in both now and probably for the next three or four years. Um, I thought that was impressive. What I am less uh, understanding of is what the, say, big two uh, very difficult, uh, perhaps intractable uh, issues and problems that the MOD has got to face this coming year. Um, is it, for instance, um, how you gain agreement on prioritization of uh, effort? Is it perhaps on uh, agreement of um, what allies uh, will be helping us with certain capabilities? Uh, could you just um, expand that or identify those two, please? Um, well, the, fir the first, I think, is um, prioritization of effort. Um, uh, we, we will need to um, make some choices um, about um, stopping doing some things and um, removing some capabilities. Um, some of those, will, those choices will be, I guess, politically difficult. Um, and, you know, that, that is not an easy uh, or straightforward sort of kind of uh, process. I personally think that um, w it's not a challenge to which we will not rise, um, uh, and I hope to do it relatively quickly, um, but we will need, I think, to adjust uh, a bit the operating model of defence in the UK, which um, I think at the moment has um, tended to um, downplay the importance of having a strong and authoritative uh, centre 
to be able to um, drive those prioritization decisions, um, take a pan-defense view in favor of um, probably devolving a bit too much responsibility to the single services. Um, so I don't, th the Levine, that's not a criticism of the Levine model, it's a criticism of the way in which the Levine model I think has been implemented. It was always envisaged that there would be a strong strategic center in my view. We haven't quite got a strong enough and quite strategic enough and quite knowledgeable enough center. So I have taken at various stages um, the slightly unpopular view of actually recruiting into the center in order to be able to give us a greater insight and a, a greater level of control. That's got quite a long way to go, and that will um, require um, uh, some changes in behaviours which are going to be quite tricky to pull off. Um, as I say, I think we need to do it, and it is um, clear and present work. Thank you. John? Thanks, uh, John Gearson. I'm uh, Director of the Centre of Defence Studies here at King's although I should reveal that I'm a professor of national security studies, which means that I might have a broader perspective. Can I put to you that you are actually in a really difficult place? I know you would agree with that. Um, <laughs> Quite comfortable. In that, well, to sort of go from what Wynne mentioned, you've got to emphasize the credibility of our forces to our opponents, and emphasize, and, and, and it has to have meaning, of course. But at the same time, you face with your public uh, spikes of interest in defense. You, you face a public that has limited interest in defense, and frankly, in Parliament, there's limited interest in defense. If you look at the number of defense questions there are per month, uh, et cetera. And yet, there is an assumption in the public that defense can actually be called upon for most crises. So somehow, you've got to make the politicians and the, and the public realize defense cannot do what they think it can do, and yet you've got to project a capable force outwards. I, I can't see otherwise how you're going to get the funding, because there is an assumption that defense can always come in and do something at a, at a time of crisis, and the scale isn't there. You know, you're one brick th uh, thick in places. How, how, how can you square that? I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I agree with your assessment about Parliament. Um, as it happens, um, I think that uh, there is an increasing, um, uh, that there is a latent level of interest and um, uh, attachment to, uh, interest in attachment to um, uh, defence. Uh, parliamentarians of all stripes um, uh, d do understand the importance of having a strong defence. Um, uh, it doesn't emerge that often because it's not often that it kind of needs to. There are other things which are on their constituents and indeed on their minds. But I, I do think that the parliamentarians by and large are, 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 are okay. I think you have a point about the, um, the, the public um, and one of the things that I think it's important um, that um, I and other uh, colleagues in defence do is to try and talk about defence a bit more because although I don't suppose it's going to change the Mori poll that much, every uh, little does help. Um, and if the CDS were here, he would say that he is very uncomfortable about public um, uh, interest in uh, defence being solely confined to you know help for heroes and you know a sense of v either victims or, 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 or heroes. He, um, he, he would like a much more um, uh, nuanced appreciation of it in the, in the public. I'm not sure how easy that is going to be, so I accept your premise that it is a, it's a, it's a tricky spot we're in at the moment. Um, but I think if we mount the arguments um, to have the capability that we think we need, um, at least the the, the political machine um, is receptive to them. Thank you. Jim. Jim Murphy. Jim Murphy. I used to be a politician. Uh, <laughs> tempted to say I'm all right now, but mm. I don't know about that. Um, I wasn't going to ask a question, but um, Nick uh, uh, set the tone for older men being allowed <laughs> to ask questions in a student audience, <laughs> partial student audience, so I'll ask. Um, I was involved in a, a variety of 
defence reviews, some supporting, some criticising, um, but they all have one thing in common, <coughs> is that they, none of them exist outside of the political context in which ministers and the PermSec and others um, have to navigate. So I'm not seeking to draw you into any politics. Or any, all, all I'm asking is in the context of you identifying, as you have done, a, a myriad of challenges this evening. One of the challenges is political context. And I wonder whether you could share with the audience where you feel, and just ref to reflect where you think the, th the review that you're currently going through, how the political context, other than Brexit, which is a catch-all excuse for everything, how you compare the political context in which you're currently operating vis-a-vis -vis those previous reviews, the one Tony Blair, George Robertson, um, David Cameron, Liam Fox, and the many others, an objective assessment of the political context for this review compared to previous ones? Um, I'm not sure that I can necessarily do that because I've only been in the job for a, a couple of years. Um, so I'm uh, not um, really aware of the um, how it played out in on the ground, as it were. Um, I think it's undeniable that all of those previous reviews really up until about um, STSR 15 um, were fundamentally about reducing the amount of money that is the nation spends on defence. Um, uh, although Nick will correct me if that's not right, um, but the amount of money that the, of GDP, the, the proportion of GDP that the nation spends on defence has been declining uh, up until about 2015 very steadily. Um, and most of those reviews were, I think, designed to be able to make sure that the that that picture of um, uh, declining expenditure was not done in a completely uncoordinated and uh, counterproductive way. Uh, I would guess. I mean, 2015 was um, different. 2015 drew a line at two percent, <coughs> um, and it committed to an awful lot of new and very expensive kit. Um, uh, and um, some of the consequences of some of those commitments um, uh, w we are sort of kind of dealing with n now. Um, I, I look upon this review um, genuinely as what it says on the tin. I mean, it is designed to be modernising. Um, that is not just about um, uh, equipment. Um, it is, as the First Lady mentioned, about a, a different view of thinking about the workforce, <coughs> which we are definitely going to have to do. Um, and it is also, a, I hope, going to create um, l lots of work about making the way in which defence itself operates um, a feel more like um, an effective modern organisation because I think in some ways actually defence in the UK is probably a bit kind of hidebound. Um, so I, I am hopeful for MDP. I think we'll end up with a stronger and better balanced force at the end of it, but I'm not saying that there aren't uh, challenges and certainly the political context that we operate in is, uh, is one of them. Okay, I've got a whole range of questions over here, please. Uh, Eleanor Doughty from the I newspaper. Um, you may be tight-lipped, but Gavin Williamson is not. Um, <laughs> was, uh, was the I'm going to go away and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> was the Defence Secretary's suggestion that Russia should go away and shut up scripted or ad-libbed? And if it was scripted, what was its purpose? Uh, I, I, I wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I think it was in Q&A. <laughs> Uh, so I think I'll probably uh, <laughs> remain tight-lipped at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Please, John. Hello, John from the House of Commons. Um, I want to take you back to the 2% NATO GDP target. Yeah. Um, do you think that it's become a convenient tool for politicians to point at and say, oh, we're spending 2%, so we're doing everything we need to? And so do you think that the cap, that it's become a kind of ceiling as well as a floor? Um, I, I, I don't think it's really been a. It's used in that way by um, 
British politicians, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, I think it is. A, I think it's an important flaw, um, but I haven't come across um, ministers who have wanted to do anything other than. Um, start from first principles and work out what it is that we think that the UK needs in alongside its allies and within its alliances in order to keep the country safe and it sort of kind of it works from that end of the spectrum rather than the two percent I think it's I think it's certainly been used um, particularly by the Americans obviously as a very convenient shorthand for um, uh, getting other European nations to increase the amount of defense spending that they're that they're doing, um, uh, but that's I think where the shorthand is. I don't think it's particularly within the UK system. Thank you, John Aitken, Commander Royal Navy. Um, Secretary Mattis, in the recent uh, National Defence Strategy uh, in the US, has made some pointed comments about um, uh, from professional military and uh, education for the US, and said that developing leaders who are competent in national security decision making requires a broad revision of talent management among the armed services, including fellowships, civilian education, and assignments that increase leader understanding of interagency decision-making processes, as well as alliances and coalitions. How confident are you that we are making um, similar strides forward in developing our senior leadership? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, one of the things I've been most impressed by since I joined Defence was has been the um, l level uh, and sophistication um, of the sort of ongoing um, educational effort that um, the single services make and the both single services and in 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 a, in a joint context. Um, I have no doubt that things could be better, but I think that we, um, with facilities like Shrivenham and RCDS and all the rest of it, are extremely um, well equipped. And I think actually the one of the testaments to that is when you ever go to, for instance, RCDS and give a speech, um, there, eighty percent of the um, students are uh, international, um, and. Not only is that a testament to the quality of um, learning that they get there and the quality of experience, but it also allows the Brits there to interact with um, uh, friends and colleagues and allies from around um, the world. If I had um, a uh, t two m mild things, well, no, two things I would like to improve, um, however, w one would be. Um, I think that we as defence and the military in particular could um, and should um, expose themselves to um, policy thinking outside defence more often than they do. Um, and I think that that is, you know, let's start with what we know. I mean, I think we should be more open to Whitehall and other Whitehall uh, views. Um, we should be welcoming, much more welcoming of. Um, uh, different perspectives and new different ways of doing things, um, and and you know that is something that I'm very very keen to, to to push forward. And it doesn't obviously stop at Whitehall. There are lots of other areas of life where we've got an awful lot um, to to um, uh, to learn. The other area where I think we are there is a very 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 sharp disparity, and I think it's something that we must uh, try and address. Is the amount of effort and um, investment that we put into training our civilians, which is a, a tiny fraction of the amount of effort and uh, investment we make in, uh, into investing uh, in, in, in people in uniform. And I think in a, an increasingly sort of kind of whole force type of um, environment where you've got civilians, contractors, Reservist, you know, that everybody is def is combining to produce defence outputs. That seems to me to be a uh, disparity and an imbalance that we've got to try and fix. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure that the UK civil service altogether actually has got its training offer right, um, but I think it's particularly acute in the Ministry of Defence because of this, because there are other bits of the organisation that do it so differently. Thank you, David. Uh, David Oman, uh, War Studies Department here at, uh, at King's. 
Um, Stephen, I think all the old hands here certainly sympathise <laughs> with the <laughs> task as you describe it. We all know about the resource constraints in terms of money, but aren't you going to find to realise your admirable vision, broad, full spectrum vision, you're going to run into some serious shortages of skills. And isn't it about, for example, computer scientists, digital technologists, and so on, of whom there are a national shortage where outside salaries are probably two to three times uh, public service salaries. Isn't it about time we started to have some flagship programs? So those who are prepared to sign up, say, for three years public service, waive the tuition freeze. Uh, you, you make a very good point. I think there are lots of areas, um, increasingly, where um, the, the nation as a whole is maybe short of some skills, and those are particularly the skills that we will require in, um, in, in, in defense. I mean, another area that I was always uh, a bit concerned about in my former job at um, Energy was uh, nuclear skills in uh, the UK. I mean, we're going to be building um, uh, one of Nick's favourite projects, uh, Hinkley Point, um, <laughs> uh, which, which um, is going to take up a lot of the capacity in the, in, in the country, but at the same time we're building the dreadnoughts, we've got to build the last of the astutes, we've got to um, at some point or other renew the warhead, we've got, uh, you know, there's a, there is a massive um, national nuclear programme which um, at the moment I am not wholly confident <coughs> we have quite got the, 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 the apparatus to be able to service. And I think the kinds of things that you're talking about are, um, are, uh, are, are absolutely right. I mean, I, on that particular subject, I have spent um, quite a lot of time with my um, counterparts at the business department and at education trying to come up with ideas along those kinds of lines. But I think if, um, as I'm sure it will, we continue to invest um, more and more and more in cyber and um, in digital. I mean, it, for instance, uh, w we have, uh, our equipment budget is 178 billion pounds over the next 10 years. About 44 of that is in nuclear. The next biggest category is um, networks and IT at 23 billion. Um, w we are going to have to um, seriously up our game, I think, to make sure that we make the right decisions there. And I think ideas like the one that you mentioned are, are, are all grist to that mill. Thank you. Sure. Um, Jeremy Pest. Uh, no, it doesn't. Oh, it does work. Yes, Jeremy Pest. I'm just a freelance nuisance, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you um, whether, given the diversity of threats that you've outlined, you think that you could have spent all those billions of pounds that were spent on the aircraft carriers better? Um, the, uh, the, the, the aircraft carriers are... Um, a, a, actually a really important part of being able to um, project the kinds of values and force um, that we want to be able to project as a country. And I, I think, um, I, I know obviously the arguments that have been made on many sort of occasions about, um, you know, cost increases and we shouldn't have had them in the first place and we haven't got any planes and all the rest of it. I, I mean, those arguments, I think, have less force now than they did in the past. It seems to me that the ability to um, work with allies, because a lot of the time they will be working with allies, they'll be protected by allies, um, and working on sort of uh, alliance uh, missions, um, as a, a, a really incredibly powerful symbol of um, the kinds of things that we wish to uphold and are under threat, such as, for instance, um, freedom of n navigation. I think that actually the aircraft carriers will be, will pay their way, and I think that they will be um, l proved to have been a very good investment for the country. 
please. Uh, Deborah Haynes from the Times. Um, do you? Th you're probably not going to answer this question, but I want to ask it anyway. <laughs> when you took over from John Thompson, did you kind of think you'd been handed a bit of a hospital pass, <laughs> given the scale of efficiencies that he'd committed to in order to balance SDSR 15? Thank you. Um, <laughs> my, my, my emotions on the day that I walked into the department um, have not changed from that day to this, and they are ones of unbounded joy and optimism uh, <laughs> at every aspect of defence. I mean, the, the, um, the efficiencies are a real ch challenge for us, um, and as I've said in other places, um, the picture, I think, is um, more confused than it ought to be, and we need to tidy it up. Um, but I, I don't feel sort of kind of like I had a hospital pass. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's part of every defence um, ministry to have to go through these kinds of processes. What, what I want to be able to do is to make sure that we do it um, as effectively as possible, and what we commit to do we actually have the resources to be able to do and can actually feel confident that we can do, and that's the process we're going through at the moment. Please. Hi there, I'm Harry Maylands. I'm a part-time PhD candidate in the Department of War Studies at King's and also a Director of Business Planning at Kinetic. Um, you mentioned, I think, the need to shorten the distance between procurement and deployment, um, and I wondered if you could go into a bit more detail on that and in particular perhaps what the role of industry might be. Well, um, what, what I, I, we, we have a uh, chief scientific advisor at the moment uh, in the form of Hugh Durrant-White, who um, is a dual Australian, um, English, uh, UK national, um, and has set up uh, a couple of very successful businesses and is an expert in uh, um, machine learning and autonomous systems. Um, and he is a very interesting and fascinating uh, bloke. So if you want to talk about that as part of your PhD, I have no doubt that he will be um, happy to chat to you. I was talking to him about this only today, and he said that actually we are not short of um, innovative ideas. Um, uh, we are not short of um, connections with um, academic and scientific and technological and engineering institutions which can throw up um, lots of interesting ideas. They're all out there. Um, the issue that we have got is to get them uh, to be uh, battlefield deployable. Um, and um, I asked him whether or not the, uh, he thought, in his opinion, the Americans were much better at this. He said that actually he thought that the Americans were rather worse at it. Um, and he gave me a couple of examples of um, where we had identified a, they were both actually around um, uh, machine learning and sort of kind of big data, where we had identified a, a need. Um, DASA, the organization that does this, went out and asked for sort of, um, uh, for, for um, uh, uh, companies to come back and sort of uh, with their tenders. They came back in sort of kind of 12 weeks. They gave the tender and within in one instance, three months, the work had been done and it had been deployed on one of the Type 45s. The, the, the trick, he um, said to me, was that um, that is an awful lot easier to do with um, SMEs um, as long as our um, procurement processes allow th them to operate and engage with us. Much more easy to do than it is with the big primes. Um, so I think that that is probably likely to be a, um, a focus for the future. And I spent quite a bit of the afternoon when I was talking to him about this, we were thinking about how we could brigade all of our sort of kind of innovation work um, b better. Not so that we would try and sort of, you know, not let a thousand flowers bloom, but actually just the, 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 the everyday, let's actually try and exploit this stuff in a way that actually means something. We can do that part of it much better, and that probably requires a slightly different type of organization. Richard. Yeah, um, R Richard Evans, uh, an executive search consultant in the city. I, I help a lot of senior military people find new jobs, and they're, and they're not. I'm so sorry. 
an ex-teacher, I'm sure you could hear me. Um, I see a lot of them, and they're not all in their 50s and 60s. Some are in their 30s and 40s. To your point about people, I'll come back to that in a minute. Secondly, money. Is there a point when we may be getting dangerously near a lack of people in our armed services that actually all the things you've rightly talked about we can't deal with? Um, secondly, how do you deal with the historical public criticism of the sheer inefficiency of the MOD in its procurement? Now, I realise that you may be picking up, Stephen, that some of the mess that some people here were responsible for. And secondly, can I say, I think we can all applaud your... I think the fact you've been here today is an incredible example of a senior civil servant who's prepared to put himself on the record. And I think we can all it's congratulate It's not on the record, you. is it? I don't know if it's on the record, but it's on my record. But seriously, I don't want you to trip up on these questions, but there is a really serious answer. Are we too low with personnel, and at what point? Secondly, the bafflement that some of us have with the procurement of the MOD, where billions, billions have been wasted. Well, I mean, the, the subject of military procurement, defence procurement, is a, is, a, is a vexed one in any country that does it on any scale at all. Um, you know, the Americans have their stories, the French have their stories, the Germans have their stories, the Japanese have their stories. Um, you know, I noticed the other day that the refit of the Russian aircraft carrier, um, the puffing billy that went down the channel um, uh, was meant to be um, $800 million worth of refit and they decided that actually they were only going to do it for $400 million because they didn't have the right. So, I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, this is not a uniquely British problem. Um, th 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 there are lots of difficult, I mean, th th there is lots of academic literature on why defence procurement is, is, um, is, is tricky. Um, we must just continue to try and do it as best as we possibly um, can and we must try and I think forge a slightly different relationship with some of our biggest primes in this country and that's something that I'm hoping to do over the next uh, year or so and I won't go into too much detail on that. In terms of um, uh, people, um, I at the moment, there, is n there are no operational outputs which have been affected by lack of manpower. Um, you know, when 8,000 people have to go out onto the streets in Octempera, then, you know, 8,000 people like that go out onto the streets in Octempera. Now, other lower priority things might then suffer, but we have always been able to satisfy um, the um, demand for the highest priority uh, tasks that the Prime Minister and the government give us. Um, I don't personally see right now any um, uh, pinch points which are going to mean that um, we won't be able to do that. Um, I think that uh, David makes a very good point earlier on about certain types of um, uh, uh, technical skills where we need to be very, very, very careful and very thoughtful and that is not just a defence issue. But at the moment in terms of straightforward sort of kind of military about how we've got enough soldiers and the rest of it, I cannot see that we would not be able to do the, 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 the would satisfy the operational demands placed on us. We may not be able to do a couple of other things, but there again, that would be beneath the radar. Okay, and uh, I've got one last question there. Let's see about time. Good evening. I'm Daniel A., current Master's student of Public Policy here. Um, grateful student of Dr. John and currently working in Parliament too. Um, you may be aware that Jean-Claude Juncker um, congratulated um, the newly re-elected President Putin today on his democratic victory and invited him to engage in further cooperation between the European Union and Russia. To quote him directly, to re-establish a pan-European security order with regards to Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, um, as well as Britain's worsening relationship with Russia, to put it kindly, where do you foresee Britain's role within this pan-European security order in the future, and where do you see our role in terms of European security as well? 
Well, I, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> see the Scots Guards lining up against, the, you know, alongside the fifty fifth sort of um, armoured infantry, sort of, you know, deploying from Sebastopol. I don't see that happening uh, very <laughs> anytime soon. Um, I, I mean, the the, the foundation of um, uh, British uh, defence is NATO. Um, and NATO um, has its sort of kind of ups and downs, but it is absolutely rock solid, and I don't think that there's any doubt about that. I'm sure it, it can be reformed, it must be reformed, but um, it is going to be there, and that is going to be our principal alliance. Obviously, it won't be with Russia. I, I said in the speech that I thought that um, it was important <coughs> that the UK leaned into um, emerging European defence um, uh, 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 structures and architecture, um, and I do believe that. Um, I think it's really important that we, um, you know, play our part in the European Defence Fund. We have a lot of industrial partners. There is a great deal of interoperability with, the, you know, the French and the Germans. You know, the Typhoon is a, as you know, a um, a, a, a cooperation between us, the Germans, the Spanish, and the. Italians. I mean, it, we, we are going to um, do ourselves absolutely no favours, and we're not going to do anybody else any favours if we think that we can row our own boat, and an awful lot of the other oars in that boat are, are European ones. So we've got to stay close to this, and we've got to try and be as influential as we possibly can. I, I should say that although obviously there is a range of views in Europe about um, how important the UK is or isn't to the future in that regard, the vast majority of them, and certainly pretty much all of the ones which are informed, know that um, the idea of maximising and optimising European defence without Britain, which is you know, the most capable European military power, with France the only one that comes anywhere near it, is for the birds. I mean, you know, they, they want the UK to be involved. I think that we should remain involved. I think the, um, the Prime Minister has been pretty clear that we should remain involved. Um, and, um, you know, w w w whilst, whilst NATO is always going to come first, that is going to be a, a more important part of um, some of the work that we do. And I have to say we are also building up some of the policy muscle around that area within the department at the moment with a view to making sure that we don't sort of kind of uh, miss too many tricks. All right, I'm going to have to draw it to a close. Uh, we're, bang, we're bang on time. But there is a drink just outside, so any questions you need to, you can certainly do so. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you to Stephen Lovegrove for a, a great lecture, yeah. very solid questioning, mm. and extremely adroit answering, mm, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.